Little House on the Prairie. Okay, the next chapter is called The Tall Indian. And I'll show you a picture of what it looks like. In those three days, the nor, the norther had howled and screeched across the prairie till it blew itself out. So that's the north wind. Now the sun was warm and the wind was mild, but there was a feeling of autumn in the air. Indians came riding on the path that passed so close to the house. They went by as though it were not there. They were thin and brown and bare. They rode their little ponies without a saddle or a bridle. They sat up straight on the naked ponies and did not look to the right or left, but their eyes glittered. Laura and Mary backed against the house and looked up at them. As they saw a red-brown skin bright against the blue sky, and they saw scallops wound with colored string and feathers quivering. The Indian faces were like the red-brown wood that Pa had carved to make a bracelet for Ma. I thought that trail was an old one they didn't use anymore. Pa said. I wouldn't have built the house so close to this trail if I'd known it was a high road. Jack hated the Indians, and Ma said she didn't blame him. She said, I declare Indians are getting so thick around here that I can't look up without seeing one. As she spoke, she looked up, and there stood an Indian. He stood in the doorway, looking at them, and they had never even heard a sound. Goodness, Ma gasped. Silently, Jack jumped at the Indian. Pa caught him by the collar just in time. The Indian didn't move. He stood there as still as if Jack hadn't been there at all. How, he said to Pa. Pa held on to Jack and replied, how? He dragged Jack to the bedpost and tied him there. While he was doing it, the Indian came in and squatted down by the fire. Then Pa squatted down by the Indian and they sat there friendly, but not saying a word, while Ma finished cooking the dinner. Laura and Mary were close together and quiet on their bed in the corner. They couldn't take their eyes off that Indian. He was so still that the beautiful eagle feathers in his scallop didn't stir. Only his bare chest and the leanness under his ribs moved a little when it, with his breathing. He wore fringe leather leggings and his moccasins were covered with beads. Ma gave Pa and the Indian their dinners on two tin plates, and they ate silently. Then Pa gave the Indian some tobacco for his pipe. They filled their pipes, and they lighted the tobacco with coals from the fire, and they silently smoked until the pipes were empty. All this time, nobody said anything, but now the Indian said something to Pa. Pa shook his head and said, No speak. A while longer, they all sat. Then the Indian rose up and went away without a sound. My goodness gracious, Ma said. Laura and Mary ran to the window. They saw the Indian straight back riding away on his pony. He held a gun across his knees. Its ends stuck out on either side of him. Pa said that that Indian, guessing by his scallop, was an Osage. Okay, I'll try to look up those that tribe, O-S-A-G-E. Unless I miss my guess, Pa said, that was French, he spoke. I wish I had picked up some of that lingo. Let the Indians keep to themselves, said Ma, and we'll do the same. I don't like having Indians underfoot around here. Pa told her not to worry. That Indian was perfectly friendly, he said, and their camps down among the bluffs are peaceful enough. If we treat them well and watch Jack, we won't have any trouble. The very next morning, when Pa opened the door to go to the stable, Laura saw Jack standing in the Indian trail. He stood stiff. His back was bristled and his teeth showed. Before him, on the path, the tall Indian sat on his pony. Indian and Pony were as still as still. Jack was telling them plainly that he would spring if they moved. Only the eagle, eagle feathers that stood up from the Indian scallop were waving and spinning in the wind. 
When the Indian saw Pa, he lifted his gun and pointed it straight at Jack. Laura ran to the door, but Pa was quicker. He stepped between Jack and the gun, and then he reached down and grabbed Jack by the collar. He dragged Jack out of the Indian's way, and the Indian rode on along the trail. Pa stood with his feet wide apart, his hands in his pockets, and watched the Indian riding farther and farther away across the prairie. That was a darn close call, Pa said. Well, it's his path, an Indian trail. It was here long before we came. He drove an iron ring into a log on the house wall, and he chained Jack to it. After that, Jack was always chained. He was chained to the house in the daytime, and at night he was chained to the stable door because horse thieves were in the country now. They had stolen Mr. Edwards' horses. Jack grew crosser and crosser because he was chained, but it could not be helped. He would not admit that trail was the Indian's trail. He thought that trail belonged to Pa, and Laura knew that something terrible would happen if Jack were to hurt an Indian. Winter was coming now. The grasses were a dull color under dull sky. The winds wailed as if it were looking for something they couldn't find. Wild animals were wearing their thick fur and Pa set his traps in the creek bottoms. Every day he visited them and every day he went hunting. Now that the nights were freezing cold, he shot deer for meat. He shot wolves and foxes for their fur and his traps caught beaver and muskrat and mink. He stretched the skins on the outside of the house and carefully tacked them there to dry. In the evenings, he worked the dry skins between his hands to make them soft, and he added them to the bundle he had in the corner. Every day, that bundle of furs grew bigger. Laura loved to stroke the thick fur of the red foxes. She liked the brown soft fur of beaver, too, and the shaggy wolf's fur. But the best of all she loved was the silky mink. Those mink furs were the furs among all the furs that Pa saved to trade next spring when he went to Independence. Laura and Mary had rabbit skin caps and Pa's cap was made from muskrat. One day when Pa was hunting, two Indians came. They came into the house because Jack was chained. Those Indians were scowling and mean. They acted as if the house belonged to them. One of them looked through Ma's cupboard and took all the cornbread. The other one took Pa's tobacco pouch. They looked at the pegs where Pa's gun belonged. Then one of them picked up the bundle of furs. And here's a picture of that. Ma held baby Carrie in her arms and Mary and Laura stood close to her. They looked at the Indians taking Pa's furs. They couldn't do anything to stop him. He carried the furs as far as the door. Then the other Indian said something to him. They made harsh sounds at each other in their throats. And then he dropped the furs. They went away. Ma sat down. She hugged Mary and Laura close to her and Laura felt Ma's heart beating fast. Well, Ma said smiling, I'm thankful they didn't take the plow and the seeds. Laura was surprised. She said, what plow? The plow and all our seeds for next year are in that bundle of furs, explained Ma. When Pa came home, they told him about those Indians and he looked sober, but he said that's all was well that ended well. That evening, when Mary and Laura were in bed, Pa played his fiddle. Ma was rocking in the rocking chair, holding baby Carrie against her, and she began to sing softly with the fiddle. Ma's voice lifted and the fiddle music died away. And the, here's the words Ma's singing about a, um, an Indian song. I'll post these words for you, but the Indian's name is um, Al Farata. And then Mary, and he lost his voice, I guess. And Laura asked, where did the voice of Al Farata go? Goodness, Ma said, you weren't asleep. <laughs> I'm going to sleep now, Laura said, but please tell me, where did the voice of Alpharata go? Oh, I suppose she went west, Ma answered. That's what the Indians do. Why do they do that, Ma? Laura asked. Why do they go west? Well, they have to, Ma said. Why do they have to? The government makes them, Laura, said Pa. Now go to sleep. He played his fiddle softly for a while, and then Laura asked, please, Pa, can I ask just one more question? 
May I ask one more question? Corrected Ma. Laura began again. Pa, may I? What is it? Pa asked. Will the government make these Indians go west? Yes, said Pa. When white settlers come into a country, the Indians have to move out. The government is going to move these Indians farther west any time now. That's why we're here, Laura. White people are going to settle all this country. And we get the best land because we got, we got here first, so we get to take our pick. Now do you understand? Yes, Pa, said Laura. But I thought this was Indian territory. Won't it make the Indians mad to have to? No more questions tonight, Pa said firmly. Go to sleep. So this is the big conflict between the Indians, Native Americans, and um, the settlers. Like the settlers came in and basically kicked the Indians out. All right, the next chapter is Mr. Edwards meets Santa Claus. The days were short and cold. The wind whistled sharply, but there was no snow. Cold rains were falling. Day after day, the rain fell, pattering on the roof and pouring from the eaves. Mary and Laura stayed close by the fire, sewing their nine patch quilt blocks or cutting paper dolls from scraps of wrapping paper and hearing the wet sound of the rain. Every night was so cold that they expected to see snow the next morning, but in the morning, they only saw sad, wet grass. They pressed their noses against the squares of glass in the windows that Pa had made, and they were glad they could see out, but they wished they could see snow. Laura was anxious because Christmas was near, and Santa Claus and his reindeer could not travel without snow. Mary was afraid that even if it snowed, Santa Claus could not find them so far away in Indian territory. When they asked Ma about this, she said she didn't know. What day is it? They asked her anxiously. How many more days until Christmas? and they counted off the days on their fingers till there was only one more day left. Rain was still falling that morning and there was not one crack in the gray sky. They felt almost sure there would be no Christmas, but still they kept hoping. Just before noon, the light changed. The clouds broke and drifted apart, shining white in a clear blue sky. The sun was shining and birds sang and thousands of drops of water sparkled on the grasses. But when Ma opened the door to let in the fresh cold air, they heard the creek roaring. They had not thought about the creek. Now they knew they would have no Christmas because Santa Claus could not cross that roaring creek. Pa came in bringing a big fat turkey. If it weighed less than 20 pounds, he said, he'd eat it, feathers and all. He asked Laura, how's that for Christmas dinner? Think you can manage to eat one of those drumsticks? Laura said, yes, she could but she was still sober. Then Mary asked if the creek was going down and Pa said, no, it was still rising. Ma said the creek was bad. She hated to think of Mr. Edwards eating his bachelor cooking all alone on Christmas day. Mr. Edwards had been asked to eat Christmas dinner with them, but Pa shook his head and said, a man would not risk his neck trying to cross that creek now. No, no, he said, that current is too strong. We'll just have to make up our minds that Mr. Edwards won't be here tomorrow. Of course, that meant that Santa Claus would not come either. He could not. Laura and Mary decided not to mind too much. They watched Ma dress the wild turkey, and it was a very fat turkey. They were lucky little girls. They were lucky to have a good house to live in and a warm fire to sit by and such a turkey for their Christmas dinner. Ma said so, and it was true. Ma said it was too bad that Santa Claus couldn't come this year, but they were such good girls that Santa Claus hadn't forgotten them. He would surely come next year. Still, they were not happy. After supper that night, they washed their hands and faces and buttoned their red flannel nightgowns and tied their nightcap strings and soberly said their prayers. So sober means to be kind of serious. They lay down in bed and pulled the covers up. It did not seem at all like Christmas time. Pa and Ma sat silent by the fire. After a while, Ma asked why Pa didn't play the fiddle. And he said, I don't seem to have the heart, Caroline. After a long while, Ma suddenly stood up. I'm going to hang up your stockings, girls, she said. Maybe something will happen. Laura's heart jumped, but then she thought again of the creek and she knew nothing could happen. 
Ma took one of Mary's clean stockings and one of Laura's clean stockings, and she hung them from the mantel shelf on either side of the fireplace. Laura and Mary watched her over the edge of their bed covers. Now go to sleep, Ma said, kissing them goodnight. Morning will come quicker if you're asleep. She sat down again by the fire and Laura almost went to sleep. She woke up a little when she heard Pa say, you've only made matters worse, Caroline. And then she thought she heard Ma say, no, Charles, there's the white sugar. But perhaps she was just dreaming. Then she heard Jack growl savagely. The door latch rattled and someone said, Ingalls, Ingalls. Pa was stirring up the fire. When he opened the door, Laura saw that it was morning. The outdoors was gray. Great fish hooks. Edwards, come in, man. What's happened? Pa exclaimed. Laura saw that the stockings limply dangling, saw that the stockings were limply dangling, and she scrooged her eyes shut into the pillow. She heard Pa piling wood on the fire, and she heard Mr. Edwards say he had carried his clothes on his head when he swam the creek. His teeth rattled and his voice shivered. He would be all right, he said, as soon as he got warm. It was a big risk, Edwards, Pa said. We're glad you're here, but that was too big a risk for Christmas dinner. Your little ones had to have a Christmas, Mr. Edwards replied. No creek would stop me after I fetched them their gifts from Independence. Here's a picture of Mr. Edwards crossing the creek. So that's how high the creek was, and it was rushing fast, so it's dangerous because you could get swept away in the current, and also it's very cold. So he took his clothes off so that they would remain dry and he could put them back on after. Laura stood up straight in bed when she heard that. Did you see Santa Claus? She asked. I sure did, said Mr. Edwards replied. When? Where? What did he look like? What did he say? Did he really give you something for us? Laura and Mary cried in excitement. Wait, wait, wait a minute, Mr. Edwards laughed. And then Ma said she would put the presents in the stockings as Santa Claus intended she said they mustn't look. Mr. Edwards came and sat on the floor by their bed and he answered every question they asked him. They honestly tried not to look at Ma and they didn't quite see what she was doing. When he saw the creek rising, Mr. Edwards said he had known that Santa Claus could not get across it. But you crossed it, Laura said. Yes, Mr. Edwards replied, but Santa Claus is too old and too fat. He couldn't make it where a long, lean razorback like me could. And Mr. Edwards reasoned that if Santa Claus couldn't cross the creek, likely he would come no farther south than the town of Independence. Why should he come 40 miles across the prairie only to be turned back? Of course Santa Claus wouldn't do that. So Mr. Edwards had walked to Independence. In the rain? Mary asked. Mr. Edwards said yes, and he wore his rubber coat. And there, coming down the street in Independence, he had met Santa Claus. In the daytime? Laura asked. She hadn't thought anyone could see Santa Claus in the daytime. No, no, Mr. Edwards said. It was nighttime, but light shone out across the street from the saloons. Well, the first thing Santa Claus said was, hello, Edwards. Did he know you? Mary asked, and Laura asked, how did you know he was really Santa Claus? Mr. Edwards said that Santa Claus knew everybody. He had recognized Santa at once by his whiskers. Santa Claus had the longest, thickest, whitest set of whiskers west of the Mississippi River. So then Santa Claus said, Hello, Edwards. Last time I saw you, you were sleeping on a corn shuck bed in Tennessee. And Mr. Edwards well remembered the little pair of red yarn mittens that Santa Claus had left him that time. Then Santa Claus said, I understand you're living down along the Verdigus River. Have you ever met up down yonder with two little girls there named Mary and Laura? I surely am acquainted with them, Mr. Edwards had replied. It rests heavy on my mind, said Santa Claus. They are both of them sweet, good little things, and I know they are expecting me. I surely do hate to disappoint two good girls like them. Yet with the water up the way it is, I can't ever make it across that creek. I can figure no way whatsoever to get to their cabin this year, Edwards. Then Santa Claus said, would you do me the favor to fetch them their gifts this one time? I would do with that with a pleasure, Mr. Edwards had answered. Then Santa Claus and Mr. Edwards stepped across the street to the hitching post where the pack mule was tied. Didn't he have reindeer? Laura asked. 
You know he couldn't, Mary said. There isn't any snow for reindeer. Exactly, said Mr. Edwards. Santa Claus was traveling with a pack mule in the southwest. And Santa Claus then uncinched the pack and looked through it, and he took out the presents for Mary and Laura. Oh, what are they? Laura cried, but Mary said, then what did he do? Then he shook hands with Mr. Edwards, and he swung up on his fine bay horse. Santa Claus Claus rode well for a man of his weight and build, and he tucked his long white whiskers under his bandana. So long, Edwards, he said, and then he rode away on the Fort Dodge Trail, leading his pack mule and whistling. Laura and Mary were silent thinking of that. And here's the picture of Santa. So he's riding a horse and then he has a mule carrying his, all the, all the presents. Then Ma said, you may look now girls. Something was shining bright in the top of Laura's stocking. She squealed oh, and jumped out of the bed. Mary did too, but Laura beat her to the fireplace and the shining thing was a glittering new tin cup. Mary had one exactly like it. These new tin cups were their very own. Now they each had a cup to drink out of. Laura jumped up and down and shouted and laughed, but Mary just stood still and looked at her. It was shining eyes, her own tin cup. Then they plunged their hands into the stockings again, and they pulled out two long sticks of candy. It was peppermint candy, striped red and white. They looked and looked at that beautiful candy, and Laura licked her stick just one lick. But Mary was not so greedy. She didn't even take one lick of her stick. Those stockings weren't empty yet. Mary and Laura pulled out two small packages. They unwrapped them and each found a little heart-shaped cake. Over their delicate brown tops, it was sprinkled with white sugar. The sparkling grains lay like tiny drifts of snow. The cakes were too pretty to eat. Mary and Laura just looked at them. But at last, Laura turned hers over and nibbled a tiny nibble from underneath where it wouldn't show. And the inside of the cake was white. It had been made of pure white flour and sweetened with white sugar. Laura and Mary never would have looked in their stockings again. The cups and the cakes and the candy were almost too much. They were too happy to speak, but Ma asked if they were sure the stockings were empty. They put their hands down inside to make sure, and in the very toe of each stocking was a shining bright new penny. They had never even thought of such a thing as having their own penny. Think of having a whole penny for your very own. Think of having a cup and a cake and a stick of candy and a penny. There had never been such a Christmas. Now, of course, right away, Laura and Mary should have thanked Mr. Edwards for bringing those lovely presents all the way from Independence, but they had forgotten all about Mr. Edwards. They had even forgotten about Santa Claus. In a minute, they would have remembered, but before they did, Ma said gently, aren't you going to thank Mr. Edwards? Thank you, thank you, Mr. Edwards, thank you, they said, and they meant it with all their hearts. Pa shook Mr. Edwards' hand, too, and shook it again. Pa and Ma and Mr. Edwards acted as if they were almost crying. Laura didn't know why. She gazed at her beautiful presence. She looked up again when Ma gasped. <gasps> Mr. Edwards was taking sweet potatoes out of his pockets. He said they had helped to balance the package on his head when he swam across the creek. He thought Ma and Pa might like them with the Christmas turkey. There were nine sweet potatoes. Mr. Edwards had brought them all the way from town, it was just too much. Pa said so. It's too much, Edwards, he said. They could never thank him enough. Mary and Laura were too excited to eat their breakfast. They drank the milk from their shiny new cups, but they could not swallow the rabbit stew and the cornmeal mush. Oh, don't make them, Charles, Ma said. It will soon be dinner time. For Christmas dinner, there was the tender, juicy, roasted turkey. There were sweet potatoes baked in the ashes and carefully wiped so that you could eat the good skins. There was a loaf of salt rising bread made from the last of the white flour. And after all that, there were stewed dried blackberries and little cakes. But these little cakes were made with brown sugar and they did not have white sugar sprinkled over their tops. Then Pa and Ma and Mr. Edwards sat by the fire and talked about Christmas times. 
back in Tennessee and up north in the big woods. But Mary and Laura looked at their beautiful cakes and played with their pennies and drank their water out of their new cups. And little by little, they licked and sucked their peppermint sticks till each stick was sharp pointed on one end. That was a happy Christmas. And here's the pictures of what they got. Okay, so I'll stop there and I'll read to you guys again soon.